I said, but don't accuse me next tomorrow morning of working for somebody else. No, 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 when I get money from them, fine, go ahead. I nervously signed the, the, the agreement with the Germans through the university, through the college, to continue this kind of work. But when I came back to London on, on, the, on the weekend and Monday morning, blowing down, the phone rang. I said, Bupenda, this is from the UK Atomic Energy Authorities. We'd like to come and see you. So I said, great, uh, whenever. And we spent about two hours. They gave me a real run, uh, breathing. And how do I do things? How do I know what? And interpret imageries and so on. I said, look, you should know. You are a nuclear physicist, all of you, technical people. You know at the back of your head what a nuclear reactor should look like and what certain facilities should look like. All I'm doing is just that. From my knowledge, which is not classified knowledge, I'm interpreting images. And uh, if I can get it right, I feel great. If I get it wrong, somebody's going to clobber me anyway. But I don't care. I don't have anything, I don't have a reputation to lose. That was my attitude. So it was the foolhardy, actually. But nonetheless, it seemed to work. And uh, so I said, that, look, we've changed our mind. We'd like to support you. So I said, but I signed a contract with the Germans. So the only solution is to establish a bilateral agreement. So I immediately picked up the phone to Germany and said, hey, listen, my government is ready to support. Can we have a bilateral agreement on, on this study? And Germans, of course, agreed. They said, Bupenda, great, we've got a nuclear weapon state supporting us. Now, I didn't see it that way, but of course, they are, the guy I know in Germany is a physicist, but a highly political animal. And he was great. He said, he said sign it. We, we have no problems. And of course, uh, after that, not only the, the UK joined in, and then the US came and said, listen, we, we can't stop this guy. So we might as well join him. At least we can control what the hell he's doing. <laughs> so the US joined, and then of course, the, the, I made a lot of studies for the IAEA, about four or five reports I wrote over a period of four years, and convinced finally the IAEA that they should use space capabilities. And by that time, the commercial satellite imageries were available freely. Not free, you know, you pay and you get it. But at least it was in the open, open field. Uh, and they accepted that this is a good idea and we will use that. Of course, the uh, US reluctantly accepted that uh, because, you know, they saw the information moving, uh, getting out of their hands, the control over information. Uh, and that they were very, very unhappy about. However, <clears throat> so how do we then, what are the treaties that we are talking about and how do we do these? Uh, we need to verify them, we need to verify them effectively. Uh, the commercial satellite imageries are getting better and better. Uh, and these are the treaties that I have been working on. Non-proliferation treaty, the conventional forces reduction treaty in Europe, uh, CWC, the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, and I wrote a report for our government some while back. And then, of course, treaties like the ceasefire and disengagement zones, like the Sudan Agreement, and then the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which is signed but not, not in, in force, because there are certain constraints. It, will not, it is not a legal document yet, but there are things that you can do, which the governments do not want to accept, well, the satellite imagery is play an enormous role because all the verification mechanism and the CTBT are after the event. They detect seismic uh, signals, they detect radiation uh, <coughs> things, all kinds of things, infrasound, nuclear radiation and so on. But these are after the horse has bought it. So what do you do? I suggested that, look, you can use satellite imagery to observe the preparations of nuclear tests. And it's been happening in the, in the past. South Africa were, were stopped from carrying out their nuclear test. India was delayed. So people have used this capability. So I said, why not put it in the, in the treaty? And I went through our government and presented a paper to them, which I wrote for the UN. So before giving to the UN, I said to the government, here is something that we should be looking at and we should propose and make it part of the treaty. Bupenda, forget it. We can't do it. Uh, the why? I can only guess the U.S. doesn't like it. So we, it never went into the part of the uh, treaty. So it's outside 
Nonetheless, fortunately, the CTBT office in Vienna is using satellite imagery for a lot of purposes. Um, and then the future treaty already mentioned here, the cutoff agreement, the fissile material production uh, treaty, uh, that could be verified from space as well, which US contended that we don't want to sign this agreement because it's unverifiable, which is not true. You can verify that. So these are the areas that I have been working on and, and uh, continue to do so. Now, what makes it possible is that states like uh, China, France, India, Israel, Japan, Russia, US, Europe, they all are building their own satellites and launching them under their own control. So you now have not only two countries, which are the US and, and Soviet Union, but now you've got a, at least half a dozen nations who are operating their own systems. And then another half a dozen countries which have their own satellites bought from commercially from these nations. And then under their control, they operate them. So there is a, a lot more possibilities now. Let's have a quick, quick look at what are the capabilities of these satellites. And I'll run through very quickly. The capability is measured in terms of uh, uh, ground resolution of a camera. So if you imagine a camera being here, and we are now all used to digital cameras. They are nothing but a series of little pixels, little elements in the focal plane of the camera. And each element will project an area on the Earth. Now if I say that a satellite has got a 20 meter resolution, what I mean is that it projects an area of 20 by 20 on, on the Earth. Now, that's a civilian satellite, but the military satellite, and we estimated already in, in, uh, in the early 80s when I started to work on space issues, that the mili military satellites have a capability of 10 centimeters. Not 10 meters, but 10 centimeters. In other words, if you stood outside, I will tell you that you are standing outside. I might not recognize you, thank goodness for that. But I can say that there is a person here. Uh, so those are the kind of capabilities that military has. But the commercial satellites now, today, I can buy an image, and I'll show you, uh, of 40 centimeters. So only four times worse than the commercial from the military. But then in the UN report when I wrote, we decided that we don't need anything better than half a meter or 50 centimeter resolution for verification. So we are already better than that capability commercially. So why don't we use that? So that's the, that's the push. Now here is a, an example of a 40 centimeter resolution image. This is an overall image in the background here. Actually, I've lost the uh, wonderful moving pictures here. Uh, yeah. However, but if you zoom into area here, what you can see is two aircrafts and four helicopters. You can actually see the rotary blades on the helicopter, helicopters. So I can now not only detect the presence of a, an aircraft, but I can actually describe it. What, I mean, what am I looking at? <coughs> and s similarly here, you've got really four kind, three, at least three kinds of uh, aircrafts of different designs. So you can beginning to see, I mean, example is here. So you see, this is the capability that exists now. You can, if you have the money, $3,000, you can buy one of these images and, and uh, just throw it on the floor. So that's the capability in the, in the visible range. Now the satellites are not only looking at, at the Earth in, in just panchromatic in, in visible area, but it looks at the color images as well. And the first one was this. Yeah, this is a, a spectrum here, but the colored are the various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that the satellite sensor looks at. So in the first satellite, multispectral satellite, there were only five bands. Now this then improved over a period of time to something like at least 10 to 12 bands. And then finally today, we've got a satellite which has got 220 channels, which means you see your spectral resolution is a lot better. I can now, as a Canadian friend of mine tells me that we can now do chemistry from 700 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Now that's a little bit exaggeration, but uh, it's not far from the truth. You can actually recognize chemicals. In fact, this satellite was built to look at the environmental uh, the pollution and so on. Now, I'm suggesting that we use that uh, for arms control verification, like chemical weapons. We can recognize what are the chemicals being ejected from a facility, and therefore we can say, work backwards and say, what the hell is happening in the building? 
So these kind of things that, that, that are possible now.